Welcome everyone, Questine here with a new discussion video for Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires to talk about even more broken and overpowered legendary lords in the game. Legendary lords that can just dominate the map with relative ease compared to some other legendary lords can, that can have campaigns where they struggle significantly. But to kick things off, let's start with Alariel, the Radiant of the High Elves. The High Elves are one of the strongest races in the game, and Alariel is one of their best legendary lords. I, I think, at the moment, if I was to do a High Elven legendary lord ranking, after all those months since I've done one, I would probably put Alariel as either the second best or the third best. Alifanar would be at the top, and then you would either have Elfarian or Alariel in second spot. Uh, Tyrion in fourth spot, and then, of course, Teclis and Emric. But what makes Alariel so damn good and what makes her campaign potential so incredibly significant? Well, there are a couple of things. First off, she can take magical forests. Her uh, stirring settlement, the Gaian Vale, is a magical forest, so she can take over m magical forests around the world. Now, this is actually more significant of a benefit than you might realize because it means in a high elven campaign as Alariel, you could conquer the entirety of Athaloran. And generally speaking, doing so is now worth your time, even if it's just unpleasant climate, because you're going to spend a lot on the construction cost, and also, of course, suffer because of the construction time. So being able to take all of these juicy settlements with a lot of building slots is actually pretty damn significant when we're thinking about uh, High Elven campaign. So that's a great deal of power just because of that. And that's probably the least significant aspect when we're thinking about Alariel's benefit. She does start the game Veil, and in her campaign, and only in her campaign, if you confederate her as any other legendary lord, you will lose this structure, but you have this unique structure, which gives you the world root entrance, which starts from dormant to withered to revived. Now, what this does is it allows you to recruit dryads, treekin, and treemen. Now, the reason this is significant is because high elves have a really powerful ranged army, but their melee capabilities aren't necessarily the best in the world. They're decent, they get the job done, they mesh well with their army, but not the best. Well, Trekin are one of the best melee infantry in the game, or monstrous infantry in the game. And the name of the game right now in Warhammer 3 is... Uh, melee infantry or the melee meta and monstrous infantry tends to do very well be it armored chaos trolls or trolls in general or treekin all those kind of units tend to do very very well now treekin in particular are heavily armored high leadership can do a lot of damage can cause fear are very very difficult to take down if you ever fight an army containing treekin treekin are going to be the hardest thing to defeat in that army and alariel can recruit these with one of the best ranged armies in the game like, Treekin and uh, Gladeguard are what make the Wood Elven army so very, very powerful in a campaign. And you can basically play like Wood Elf, but with all, with all the benefits that come from uh, playing a High Elf. So, uh, basically, Alariel is kind of like this hybrid legendary lord through the ability to recruit Treekin uh, Tr uh, in her campaign and all these Tree Spirit units. She's kind of like this hybrid Wood Elf. Uh, High Elf legendary lord, which is very lore appropriate, by the way, considering her lore... Uh, her role in the lore uh, at this moment, especially in Age of Sigmar. So that's uh, the first thing, that's one of the first significant benefits. The other significant benefit is that she gets the special structure, the Handmaiden's Gallery. So Alifanar and Alfarian also have their own unique units. But here's the real benefit for Alariel. She, this structure will allow her at tier 3, so basically in any settlement, major, minor, doesn't matter, she can recruit Sisters of Avalorn. Now, being able to get this building in a minor uh, settlement is a significant benefit in of itself because it means you don't have to occupy a building slot in one of your capitals so you can devote your capital to buildings that you need more like things like the Elven Court, the theater, other buildings as well for your unit recruitment or your economy. That is an enormous benefit to begin with just being able to recruit the Sisters of Avalorn. But it's not just that. It also increases your hero capacity at tier 3 four handmaidens by one and unlocks your recruitment of handmaidens that is significant that is enormously significant in a campaign as a larial or in general very significant because handmaidens are incredible heroes and just the ability to increase hero capacity at tier three is very significant for any high elven campaign because if we look at their hero capacity generally speaking if we're talking about the high elves you're gonna need to uh usually get 
a structure to tier 4 in order to increase your hero capacity, be it mages, nobles, and even handmaidens for other legendary lords. Well, the fact that you can do this at tier 3 as Elarial gives her a significant amount of power, means she'll have a lot more heroes running around, even if we're just talking about handmaidens, and handmaidens are really, really powerful. Now, she does suffer a significant downside because of the Defender of Wolf 1, though it's only a downside to start once you get going as a Lariel, so she does have a pretty slow start, but once you get going, this will turn into a significant benefit in terms of diplomatic relations, control, construction costs, and income from buildings. So, at the start, while you're dealing with these Dark Elves inside of Avalorn itself, and while Tyrion is dealing with the Cult of Excess over here, you will suffer these penalties. Once you deal with those, when you've uh, taken control and you and Tyrion have taken control over Inner Ulf one and established that control, um, these negatives are going to go away and you're certainly going to have po uh, positives. On top of that, Alariel also has the ability faction-wide in settlements that where she visits, in settlements that she visits, she puts in a buff. This gives you influence, control, growth, corruption. Pretty powerful. And Winds of Magic, of course. Chance to increase Winds of Magic. On top of that, she has an influence cost of minus 25% for Intrigue at Court, Hero Capacity plus 2 for Handmaidens, and Invocation of Leaf improves casting and magic item drop chance, as well as Greater Invocation of Isha. So Greater Invocation of Isha is this one, gives you 8% casualty replenishment, immune to attritional armies, minus 10 corruption, and gives you regeneration for those three units. <laughs> Secretly, I think she has one of the better armies of tree spirits in the game. I mean, obviously, Durfu and Draika have their own significant benefits when it comes to that, but I'd probably say she actually has a better Treekin army than either the, the Sisters of Twilight or Orion, because, hey, regeneration. Even if it's only something that lasts 10 turns with, with a cooldown duration of 40 turns, it's still pretty damn significant uh, when you consider it. But that's just faction-wide effects. Then... Um, then there's um, the benefits that Talariel has for your entire campaign, and which makes her really good to confederate if you're playing another legendary lord as um, as the, the High Elves. Though I would certainly recommend getting the reset skill uh, point mod, uh, or one button reset skill um, mod, uh, so you don't miss out on these opportunities. But certainly having extra hero capacity for handmaidens and a structure that gives you handmaidens, that's going to be very significant. Now. In terms of her special skill line, she does have two choices, Tradition, Dictates, or Blood and Fire. Now, Blood and Fire can be pretty decent, campaign movement range, upkeep, leadership, all kinds of benefits in battle. 10 armor for forest spirit units, you imagine Trigan with 10 more armor, yeah, that's pretty significant. But really, it's Tradition and Dictates that make her incredibly good. She gets a construction cost benefit and diplomatic relations benefit. Uh, she gets the ability to recruit handmaidens faction-wide, as well as increasing their uh, hero capacity and hero recruit rank and also uh, reducing the recruit recruitment duration for Sisters of Avalorn uh, by minus one, and also giving them extra melee defense in her own province. This is very significant, because it means that you'll be, again, running around with a lot more handmaidens, and you can recruit them faction-wide. Now, here's what makes handmaidens so good, because it's really the benefits with handmaidens that make Alariel... Uh, such a top-tier legendary lord. Everything else is pretty sweet. Don't get me wrong. Sisters, Treekin, Treemen, all that. That's pretty good. But it's really the handmaidens that are part of the DLC that she comes with that really uh, make her shine. See, handmaidens have the following skills. They can do replenishment. They're pretty decent melee combatants, but it's not about their combat ability. It's about this skill line. Now, it is exclusive with these two other skill lines, so you're not going to have their ranged ability. You don't really give a damn about their ranged ability. You're going to miss out also the protector of the Everqueen. It's not too significant missing out on that, considering what you're getting. So you're getting two diplomatic relations with High Elves, two diplomatic relations with all factions, 5% income from tariffs, and one influence per turn. So for each handmaiden, and understand this, if you're playing as a Lariel, you'll have, you'll, you'll start with the handmaiden, you have hero capacity plus two, so you have, you start with free hero capacity for handmaidens, and then you get up to four handmaidens without a structure. And the structure itself that allows you to recruit handmaidens will buff that up. Uh, we'll, we'll buff that up to five. Five handmaidens is a ridiculous amount. So Seven. five handmaidens means plus 10 diplomatic relations with all factions. 
it means that you overcome a lot of aversion that factions feel towards you. It means that you can get a lot more trade agreements with a lot more factions. That's why handmaidens are so significant, and that's the real power that Delariel has in her campaign. Because the high elves they thrive on trade because they produce um, they produce trade resources. So factions like you, which they will, because you'll be have, you'll be running around with a lot of these handmaidens. If factions like you then that means they'll be more likely to trade with you. So you can get a lot more trading partners. That means you can see more around the world because of how the high elves work when it comes to trade because high elves do gain vision because of their uh, trading mechanic. Like the, visions over, like the vision over here, for it's instance, is it's just because time. I've gotten trades. Well. So for instance, if I trade to Kalador, um, I get even more vision because that's how uh, their spying mechanic, if you will, uh, works will in the game. So. You can get a lot of uh, trade benefits from handmaidens. They're not the best in combat. Sure, nobles are much, much better. Hell, even lore masters, I would say, are better in from a pure combat ability. But the significant diplomatic benefits with all factions and the 5% income from trade tariffs, that will net you a lot of money and also having influence because each handmaiden is one influence per turn. But it's not just that, by the way. It's not just that, because you also then get another ridiculous part to this. Every handmaiden at rank 16 can give you one control in all of your provinces. So just consider the three, four, or five actually. Five handmaidens you can get pretty quickly in a campaign as a Lariel. Each of them is going to give you one control. So you're looking at five control faction-wide. And you can get a lot more than five handmaidens in a campaign. You can get 20. Rebellions will never be a thing. You'll be maxing out control very, very quickly. And this is something the High Elves, again, benefit from. So, because High Elves generate more money when they have control to 100. So Alariel having that kind of control benefit, that diplomatic benefit, that trade tariff benefit, it just meshes so very, very well into the core uh, playstyle of the High Elves that it's ridiculous how much power she has. Now, don't get me wrong, Alifanar is still better, but I gotta say, when it comes to just pure economic output, Alifanar has got nothing on the benefits that Alariel can have during the course of her campaign just because of her recruitment benefits with handmaidens. I'd say she actually scales in like in the very long, long, uh, long game. Uh, she's Scale's probably better. And then there's the final benefit. She starts pretty close to the Sword of Cain. She can get easy access to it. I mean, Ali Fanar and Tyrion can also get it. Like, all the legendary lords, like, even Alfarian can get the Sword of Cain. But I would say, uh, Alariel probably has the easiest access to it. And here's the thing about the Sword of Cain. Generally, the Sword of Cain has significant downsides, right? Because diplomatic relations, all that. So... One of the things you can do in a campaign playing as a Lariel, because you're going to get so many benefits in diplomacy and control, is you can basically wield the Sword of Cain, get all the benefits that gives you, and you're nullifying the downsides of that. That is why a Lariel is so, uh, such a good legendary lord to play. Pretty, pretty shitty start, I gotta admit, just because you have to take the Phoenix Gate, which has a very substantial garrison, but you do have all the tools necessary to uh, deal with all of that, so... Just go on ahead, and once you overcome that early game, you're just going to be curb stomping throughout the entirety of this campaign. And number four on this list, we have Grimgore Ironhide of the Greenskins. The Greenskins are a really powerful race, but why is that? Well, first off, they have the Wa Meter, so every battle they fight and win, they fill this up. It can be filled up very, very easily. You get control, growth, recruitment costs, winds of magic, and leadership. The leadership aspect is actually very significant because it means your units are going to be very unlikely to break in battle. It also makes fighting the Greenskins something of a nightmare when they have a Wa going. And once you fill it up, you can declare a WA, and basically what that means is every army is going to get another army, a WA army, attached to it. Which isn't necessarily going to be the best army, but it's still going to have uh, quite a few units, up to 20 units in that. So every army you have can be 40 units in total. Now, that's just some of the things about the Greenskins. Uh, even their baseline Goblin Archer units are very significant, because although they lack range the sheer amount of damage they can do is ridiculous the reason they can do so much damage though 
is because of the skills or the improvements you can get via the research resource, like 10% missile strength for goblin and night goblin units as an example, or some upgrades you can get for them as well. So a great deal of power uh, for the green skins, like 8% more uh, missile strength for them, for every uh, lord with the gobos. Now, some people object to using goblins on Grimgore, but it's worth knowing in Lord that although he hated them, he certainly did have them as part of his armies. Until he decided to kill them at one point after losing a particularly nasty battle. But anyway, uh, Grimgore, what makes him so ridiculously overpowered? Well, first off, he's an incredibly good duelist. By default, he is going to have the ability your next. Now, your next is just going to make it so that whatever unit, uh, whatever Lord or hero he uses it on, is just going to flat out die because it's going to lose melee defense so its chance of avoiding hits is going to go down its chance of hitting targets is going to go down so it's just going to make it so they die very very quickly and grimgore himself has a lot of damage and the majority of that is armor piercing damage so a great deal of damage great deal of power when it comes to dueling he's actually one of the better duelists in the game not the best far from it but uh, he's certainly one of the better ones uh, when it comes to it now, uh, faction-wide benefits, he gets 10% campaign movement range, uh, minus 15% upkeep for Black Orcs and Biguns, so he can really make a Black Orc or Bigun army work very, very well. Waz have a chance to contain Black Orcs, which are really good units, and he can recruit um, Black Orc big bosses faction-wide in every province from the very start of his campaign. That is pretty substantial. In terms of his special skill line, it's mainly focused on those units or on his own co uh, combat ability uh, when we're looking at the skill line. So not nothing uh, especially great when it comes to it, though it's going to buff his uh, power in battle through the roof when we're thinking about this. He does get two hero capacity for Black Orc big bosses and also the passive ability best of the best Um which gives him melee defense and damage resistance when no enemy lord or hero is present in ability range. So if he's fighting on his own, he's monstrous. If he's fighting in a duel, he's a monster because of the your next ability. So Grimgore is just flat out uh, a monster. And he's pretty damn fast for given his size, especially because like from, uh, from the front ability. So Grimgore, really, really powerful when it comes to that. But it's not these things uh, that really give him uh, they really give him a lot of power. No, it's not these things at all, actually. See, the thing that makes Grimgore so really, really powerful is that unlike St. Grom the Paunch, which starts surrounded by enemies and major ones at that, that he's going to have to fight for his entire campaign. I've been playing a Grom the Paunch campaign, and the power is certainly there, but it, damn, fighting enemies nonstop can certainly be tiring. Uh, but then again, it's like, what, that's the campaign at turn 40 or so, and I'm conquering Wolf 1 at that point? Yeah, I'd say the power is there. But here's the difference between someone like Grimgore and the other legendary lords of the Greenskins. Grimgore has no opposition. Because Grimgore only has Kolik as a legendary lord next to him. Even if, even when the Chaos Dwarves get added into the game, soon enough, I imagine... He's only going to have, like, what, maybe one or two Legendary Lords to contend with? That means Grimgore is able to just annihilate every other faction that surrounds him. Because his army is flat out better than anything the Ogres can bring to bear against him. Uh, he can navigate this very uh, faster. He can navigate the terrain that the Ogres have in their own homeland better because he has the underway. So he has a lot of flexibility in this campaign in terms of navigating the terrain he has. He's much more powerful than every other faction that surrounds him with the exception of Kolik. And when it comes down to it, Kolik may have a substantial army. You can bring two or three substantial armies against him. Even if you're just literally massing goblin archers, Kolik will not be able to stand up against you in that particular situation. And once you deal with Kolik, you can even make a diplomatic agreement with Kolik. You don't necessarily need to fight the bastard. But if you do fight uh, Kolik, you defeat him. No one else is gonna, going to oppose you because all you have to the north are minor uh, factions of demons and Norse gods. Eventually, are, you might come in contact with Village and Archeon. But by the time you come in contact with them, you're already going to be an unstoppable machine of death and destruction. 
and they just won't be able to stop you by that point. Because even if they do send armies against you, you'll just respond with three, four armies. The only issue with the castaways is it's the castaways, it's uninhabitable. Uh, uninhabitable. But outside of that, you're in a really, really good campaign start. See, this is the thing about overpower legendary lords. It's not necessarily just the power they have, it's the campaign start they have. Grimgor has an incredibly good campaign start. Now, Grom, with all the power he gets from his cauldron, yes, he is flat out better, much better than the other ones. Uh, but Grimgor has a much easier start, and this is the kind of campaign where you can dominate your opponents, or the only effort that you might have to put in this campaign is at the very start of it against Kolik. Once you deal with that, it's smooth sailing, easy road, and there's a reason why Grimgore, when played by the AI, becomes one of the most powerful AI empires in the entire game when we're talking about legendary very hard difficulty. Like, I don't think I've seen a single campaign where Grimgore didn't conquer like two-thirds or the entirety of the Mountains of Morn, as well as substantial portions of the Darklands and just became a major menace in the campaign. And that's because he's a very powerful lord for a powerful faction with a great starting position. And number three, we have Colex Sunnyter of the Warriors of Cast. Now, all the Warriors of Cast legendary lords are really powerful in their respective campaigns, and pretty much every single one of them, with the exception of Festus, can be a steamroll from the very beginning until the very end. I mean, with Fest, even with Festus, it's not really going to be that much effort. It's just a bit more effort than the minimal effort that's required in the other campaigns. Now. Uh, Kolek does have certain advantages in his campaigns. He is a legendary lord of Chaos Undivided, so what he'll start with is a Hell Cannon. Now, a Hell Cannon is a really, really good artillery piece that is quite capable of destroying t uh, towers and walls very quickly in battles, or wall towers and walls uh, very quickly in battles. He also focuses on monstrous units, and he'll start with Dragon Ogres and Chaos Trolls. Now, Chaos Trolls in particular are really great units because you can easily upgrade them to the armored version, which have a ridiculous, absurd level of armor and can certainly punch way above their weight as units. So a significant amount of power with Kolok from the very beginning. He does start. He can get the Vassal very quickly in his campaign on turn one. Uh, that has two regions, so that means more Vassal income, all that kind of, uh, all those kind of benefits. I mean, yeah, the Vassal is not going to generate anything because they don't have any structures at the very start. But once they get going, they'll uh, they'll give you some benefits. On top of that, Kolek gets, uh, gets a great deal of strength in battle with every single uh, vassal that he has. So you're really heavily encouraged to vassalize with him. It can be so absurd in terms of the power level that th this guy has. And his baseline power level, it's not weak. I mean, he has better stats than Grimgore, actually, in quite a few ways. And the more vassals you gain, the the more uh, that'll improve. Now, in a duel between the two of them, I would say that uh, Grimgore uh, does have some advantages because of his uh, abilities, but certainly when we're thinking about uh, certainly when we're thinking about Kolik's abilities in battle, uh, it's fairly significant. But it's not that none of these things, not the benefits of the Warriors of Chaos, not the fact that he has all the that he has access to, the, uh, to all the gifts of Chaos, so Grove for replenishment from Nurgle, uh, economic benefits from Slanesh, uh, post-battle loot from Korn, all that. It's not those things that really make Kolek stand out. It's the following fact. In any campaign that you play, Grimgor is just going to spend maybe a couple of turns uh, just building an army on Legendary Very Hard. Or he might take Ice Pure very quickly before you arrive there. But it doesn't matter. If he takes Ice Spear, you just go in, you beat the crap out of him. If he just spends the first few t a unit, it turns building up an army, you attack the secondary army, the secondary lord he's going to build outside of Saber Mountain. You force an open field engagement, or even if you force a siege, you're good at sieges because you have the following Gift of Chaos over here, Shatter Stone, Missile Resistance, and the ability of breaking down walls with that. And you are you have a stronger army than what Grimgor can recruit early on, much stronger army, because he only has a tier 1 barracks. Uh, if you let Grimgor grow, that's when he becomes a problem, but early on, if you can eliminate him very quickly, then that's significantly easier. But here's the thing, you don't eliminate Grimgore, you vassalize Grimgore, and then 
you unleash them. You declare war on every faction surrounding you and watch Grimgor just beat the crap out of all of them while you sit in AFK. Like, you can literally, in this campaign, you can literally just take Grimgor as a vassal within the first few turns. Like, what do you do? You take the Challenge Stone, uh, you build an army, you recruit units. You also have access to a Regiment of Renown once you get to rank 2, the Summoners of Rage. So you have a great deal of power, army power, from the very start of your campaign over here. Um, from very early on in your campaign. You get those Summoners of Rage very quickly over here. I wouldn't necessarily get them as quickly here. But still, you get those Summoners of Rage. You take an army. You should have a full stack by the time you arrive over there. Very shortly. Um, you make Grimgor a vassal. And then you declare war on all of the factions surrounding him. Or one at a time. Not all of them at once. One at a time. You let Grimgor conquer them. Then you declare war on another faction. On another faction as, you, as Grimgor encounters them. And he will literally conquer all of them. You may help him. You may take some territory for yourself, like the Dark Fortress over here. Or you may ask him to give it to you. Vassals will actually do that for you. While you m march your army east and take the Dark Fortresses, the three Dark Fortresses that are here in the east, or rather the five that are clustered around here, you, uh, you may want a vassalized village at the very least over here because uh, he might be useful as a vassal. You can't confederate village as Colic, unfortunately, because only Archeon and Bellacor can. It is a bit of an unfortunate situation that you can, because I think this campaign would be better for it if you could confederate uh, like Archeon and village. But even without that confederation, you have Grimgor as a vassal, who is an absolute beast when controlled by the AI. And I've already talked about the virtues that Grimgor has in his campaign. Well, you will have him as your vassal, and you'll have Kolik as well. That is an incredible level of power that Kolik has access to during the course of his campaign. And his campaign, like many others of the Warriors of Chaos, just a complete steamroll effect. But I think it's something else to make Grimgor a vassal and then watch him build a massive empire uh, from very early on in his campaign. Fun fact, when you make him a vassal, he'll gain a full stack of units in Saber Mountain. That's just absolutely ridiculous uh, over there. So, significant power in this campaign, significant opportunities. And you don't have to stop with Grimgor. There are, of course, other factions you can forcefully vassalize. Grimgor is just the most ridiculous uh, option over here. And you can do it very quickly. Sure, you can eventually do it if you're playing as Archeon. You could eventually do it. But that would require you to go into a long war against Grimgor and all that. Because by the time you arrive here as Archeon, Grimgor will have set up an empire. Whereas Kola can just rush Grimgor and have him build an empire as his vassal. Number two, we have Helmen Gorst of the Vampire Counts. Now, Helmen Gorst has been consistently ranked as one of the best legendary lords ever since Immortal Empires came out. The reason behind that is fairly simple. The Vampire Counts are one of the best factions in the game, one of the best races in the game that have a great deal of power. Why do they have so much power? Well, they can flat out raise the dead, so that means they can get access to some pretty high tier units very quickly during the course of the campaign if they fight some major battles. So, if you're fighting a major battle, you may end up being far stronger for it because you might be able to recruit a very high level army. And Gorst is absolutely ridiculous when it comes to this. So, for instance, in his initial province, he can get 17 units. That is already. And then he moves on to this next province and just uh, switching to... Uh, to enable replenishment and you can uh, get up to 20 units first turn of your campaign. You can also take magical forests which is always a benefit I gotta say just being able to take these lovely uh, magical forests in a campaign. So there's a great deal of power Gorst uh, does have just on accounting of like the starting army situation, the start position situation. He's like just by default, the vampire counts are stronger than the Skaven, Cafe, or uh, the Ogre stop. Kingdoms that's surrounding him. <laughs> He's certainly stronger than poor Kugaf over here on uh, on the Dragon Isles. Poor Kugaf, poor forgotten yes. Kugaf. But it gets only better from there, much better from there, actually. He gets 10% casualty replenishment faction wide, which is always significant for vampire counts because they're going to take a lot of damage due to the poor out resolve they currently have. Like, their armies are strong, but they're kind of like in that same position where, where they're like Skaven, where they 
have to fight a lot of battles manually because their units have very low armor. But here's the thing about Gorst. Uh, he has poison attacks for zombies, skeletal spearmen, and skeletal warriors. He has a raid a raised dead pull capacity uh, and casualty replenishment. And on top of that, through his special skill line, he gets mega buffs for zombies, melee attack, ward save, battle healing cap um, for them as well. Just, just a great uh, deal of power. The most significant one is the Ravenous Dead ability that he can give to zombie units faction-wide. So they don't need a corpse card to be able to regenerate. They'll just be able to regenerate by being melee. And zombies, by default, have a pretty good amount of HP and are pre can be pretty effective meat shields. Well, Gorst actually makes them decent melee units. Not the best melee units, but they're cheap as dirt when we're thinking about these guys. Like, just a regular zombie might be 19 upkeep. And they might be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and will be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against units that have a much higher upkeep. So you can maintain a lot of armies much, uh, more, much more cheaply. You also do have uh, various other benefits when it comes to upkeep, battle healing cap, all those kind of things uh, when we're looking at Gorst and uh, just benefits with uh, Raise the Dead. So a great deal of power in this campaign and just the sheer ability to maintain pretty powerful and very, very cheap armies uh, during the course of your campaign is, is very, very significant, I would argue. Because it's very easy to just get a bunch of zombies in this campaign. And also you will get them at a pretty high rank uh, in this um, in the initial province. Because you do get that special structure which gives you four, uh, plus 4 recruit rank for zombie units. It only affects recruitment in this particular province. But it is pretty damn ridiculous when, uh, when, you're, when you see it in action. So a great deal of power in this campaign. Gorst actually counts for a lot himself towards the Atrazolf. He is really ridiculous. And like with Gremgor, like with Kolik, like with others, he doesn't really have any major opposition. The only major opposition in this fact in, 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 that he may face in his campaign, and not necessarily so to be clear, is of course Yao Ming of Cafe. But your army is better than Xiao Ming's. Your army is better than uh, like Greece's. It's a lot better than Kugaf's. The only one that might stop you is Emmerich, but Emmerich has a large number of issues in his campaign to deal with, even when you're not counting Gore. So the only real opposition is going to be Emmerich, but doesn't matter. Throw four armies. Because you can maintain a lot of zombie armies very cheaply, where the most significant, where the most costly aspect of the army might actually just be the Lord, and the units themselves are dirt cheap. That is the power that Helmand Gorst has in his campaign. He is the most powerful legendary lord for the vampire counts. He's one of the most powerful in the game. I don't like his campaign, to be honest with you. I'd much rather play Vlad or Isabella or even Manfred. Yes, I would rather play Manfred than play Gors, but the power is there and it cannot be denied. One on this particular list, we have Malice Darkblade of the Dark Elves. Now, the Dark Elves aren't the, one of the best races in the game, though they're certainly pretty good. When it comes to it, they're not Warriors of Chaos, Greenskins, or Vampire Counts level, or even High Elven level. They do have issues when it comes to the control of their provinces because of the slave mechanics that they do have to deal with. That said, they do have a ridiculous level of power. See, the power they have is that they can get a lot of money from sacking settlements. And they can also recruit some very good units for pretty cheap early on in their campaign. This is because they're Black Arcs. Their Black Arcs give them, in a radius, a benefit from income uh, from sacking settlements, up to 60% benefit uh, from sacking settlements. That is ridiculous. And that's before you factor in the fact that they can get uh, a right that gives them plus 50% post battle loot. That's pretty damn ridiculous when you think about it. On top of that, Black Arcs allow them, even at level one, the ability to recruit uh, Black Arc Corsairs. Now, Black Arc Corsairs, they're very cheap and uh, very cheap units. They're very cheap to recruit, not too expensive to maintain either in your campaign. The reason they're so good is they have high leadership, high armor. AT armor is pretty high armor for a unit that usually you'd recruit at tier 3. With Black Arcs, you can recruit them at tier 1. AT armor, high leadership, good melee stats, really good in, in, in a battle. And you combine them with Dark Shards, you combine them with some other units, you do have some very good 
and effective armies, especially from the Black Arcs. And the Black Arcs can allow you to recruit the entire Dark Elven roster. You don't have global recruitment, you have Black Arc recruitment. That is a, a significant amount of power from an economic standpoint, from an early game standpoint especially. And the early game is always the most difficult part of your campaign. The reason it's uh, such a great deal of power, you'll be earning a lot of money from sacking settlements, you'll also be able to recruit very effective armies, and the Black Arcs themselves can maintain an army. Like for instance here I have a full stack over here in a Black Arc, I have another Black Arc with a full stack, I'm building another one. And you can see here, this is turn 43, and I'm swimming in money. Like, I have two, three, four, five armies here, six over here, all made up of Black Ark, uh, Black Ark Corsair units and Dark Shards. And all of these armies are pretty good, effective armies that you can maintain. It's kind of ridiculous how much money you can make, but the Black Arcs themselves give you a significant upkeep benefit. You can transport armies around, maybe have a Lord, and Black Arcs can recruit Lords themselves. So if you ever need to go and land with an army, if it's not next to the shoreline where the Black Arcs themselves can attack, you can always recruit a Lord uh, from over here. It will be level 1, and you can move inland. Yes, your upkeep will shot up, uh, shoot up for a couple of turns, because you'll lose the upkeep benefit here, because it's uh, it starts at minus 50% and can go all the way to minus 60%. Over here on this one at tier 3, I have minus 5, 55%. And then you have the minus 6% for those specific units. On top of that, block Lord arcs of give you the ability to recruit all the hero types of the Dark Elves. It won't increase hero capacity, very crucially, but it does give you the ability to recruit those heroes. Okay, so that's the Dark Elves. Good race, has a lot of early game benefits. What does Malice Darkblade do? Because keep in mind, the racial benefits themselves are very significant. The fact he starts with the Black Arc is in itself very significant. But that's nothing to do with his faction benefits. Okay, here are the following things. His faction benefits, uh, when you're looking at the list, may not seem too significant. But here's the thing. You are actually pretty friendly with demonic units, with, with demons. Like over here... I just took this element, gave it to the Demon Prince. I have a non-aggression pact and military access with the Demon Prince. He's not going to bother me. And actually, me making that deal with him has actually made them powerful. So I don't have to worry about that. I did end up in a war with uh, with Trog uh, to, a, to a small extent. And the Varg, which I conquered very, very easily. Um, but you do have a significant diplomatic benefit with demons because of the position mechanic. So you have this mirror from minus 10 to 10. At 10, you're fully possessed. When you're fully possessed, you generate a lot of Salinity Corruption, but you get plus 50 diplomatic relations with Demons of Chaos, 40% ward save for Malice himself, 10 melee attack for his entire army, 20% missile strength for his army, and Sarkun as an ability, which makes him absolutely ridiculous in battle. Now, you're generally not going to have full possession, in, uh, or you actually will have it is possible to play an entire campaign fully possessed, but it's not necessarily worth it. All right, because if you have full control, you have equally ridiculous benefits. Minus 15 corruption in all provinces, which is, by the way, very significant when you're starting in northern cast wastes and regions that have a great deal of corruption. Now, usually you're not going to have minus 10. You're probably going to be uh, going from minus 6 to minus 9, but even then, that's minus 5 uh, cor uh, corruption. A great deal of gro growth, up to plus 100 growth, so you can grow your settlements very quickly. The reason I have such a powerful economy here, uh, the reason I'm generating 30,000 income at 343, and this is, by the way, not one of the highest, but certainly really good income. But the reason I'm able to generate such a high level of income is because I've been able to grow these settlements very, very quickly. Like, I have tier 4 settlements here. I'm not running out of money to build these settlements because I gain a lot of money from sacking settlements. I have good growth because I'm playing as Malice Darkblade. Soon enough, I'm going to take Valkyrie as capital. I'm probably going to give it to Malekith or um, or maybe Halibron to get better relations uh, with them. But I have a great... You have fast growth, a lot of money potential. You have the right of the War Master, which summons a Doomstack army, basically. For 12,000, you're summoning a Tier 5 army with Replete to the Lord. And this is not like those gimmicky armies like Scarbrand and Akari have. No, these are. this is a proper endgame army with a Lord that you 
can take those units and transfer them to other armies. And in fact, this army, like I could summon this, like if I summon this right here, I, I can only do it in one turn. If I summon this uh, particular army, I can actually maintain it at uh, this particular uh, turn in, in my campaign. So you have the choice between an insane level of loyalty, growth, corru uh, corruption benefit, the ability to summon an endgame army every every 50 turns. That will that's much better. That that's like an endgame crisis level army, though it doesn't have a level uh, the same level of lords and uh, heroes. On top of that, you also have the gift to the Witch King, which will give you a dilemma to just summon a hero of a certain rank, dependent on the number of settlements Malakif controls not you malekith so the more settlements malekith controls the more you can summon here does mean i do wonder how that works with confederation i haven't really played the campaign uh, as malice dark played because i do prefer, when i'm playing a dark elven pl a campaign i do prefer playing something like morathi or um or loki or felhart i just like their campaigns more but the, the level of power uh, malice dark plane has is ridiculous and that's not even counting his skill line so skill line wise he gets an upkeep benefit to cold one night it's not really significant though his army is immune to cast on divide the corruption and cast waste attrition which is great because you just start the northern cast waste he gets some significant benefits in battle especially if he's possessed uh, he can cause terror when he's transformed in sarkhan he gets campaign movement range vigor loss reduction for those units attrition an attrition benefit, a loyalty benefit, a control benefit, upkeep benefit. This guy is ridiculous. In fact, when he was added in Warhammer uh, 2, he was one of the few uh, lords that was capable of being a uh, one-man doomstack. Since then, things have obviously changed in a significant fashion. But even uh, to this day, Malice Darkblade is one of the most ridiculous legendary lords in the game. I mean, Legend of Total War played an entire campaign conquering the map basically with just him. There's a reason behind that, suffice, it, uh, suffice to say. Uh, because he has regeneration combat, he has good... Uh, he can replenish a lot of the damage he takes very, very quickly uh, over here. Uh, he, can re uh, he can regenerate a lot of the damage he personally takes. Uh, very uh, very quickly he has a quest item that gives him replenishment in combat and damage resistance as well so a great deal of power of malice dark blade he's kind of a monster in battle even without position you give him position and he's flat out the best duelist in the game or certainly one of the best i'm not sure exactly who would be able to compete against him when it comes to uh, battle potential and I don't think any other legendary lord could conquer the campaign map on their own the way this guy can. So yeah, that is a ridiculous level of power that he has access to. And he also has these missions, by the way, Tsarkhan's uh, Whispers, that can give you certain benefits, certain items uh, that you can get access to. I have kind of been ignoring them in this campaign. But this campaign has been a significant breeze. And it will be. Now, I don't like this campaign necessarily uh, the most because... Yes, he has power, but I prefer uh, playing a campaign where there's more involvement. And as as Malice Dark played, you'll start over here. And you'll conquer this territory without any significant opposition until you meet Sieg Sigvald. And you're better than Sigvald. You're better than Valkia as well. Actually, you're better than both of them combined. In fact, I'm pretty sure Malice on his own could probably solo both Valkia and Sigvald's armies. Maybe even put together. That is how, that is the level of ridiculousness we're talking about here. Anyway, that's all there is to say. Costini here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.